what, are, what are actually planning to do in this session is to um, bridge from uh, the discussions that we were having yesterday about the impact of digital technologies in society at large to narrow down the focus a little bit on what is happening now in the scientific world and what are the specific challenges that are going on in there and also try and focus a little bit more on what is going on in the biological and biomedical sciences and obviously um, my co-panelists will then go much deeper into some of these issues. So, some of the reasons why people um, point very widely to the revolutionary potential of big data specifically and also of open data, which were mentioned yesterday, for scientific research is, first of all, obviously that they provide the opportunity to actually um, produce more accurate um, predictions. And also, they really open up a world in which you can put together lots of different types of data coming from different sources, and this allows you to actually spot patterns and make correlations that you wouldn't otherwise have been able to do, and that can actually point you to the direction in which your research should be going. So what are the gaps that still need to be filled? What are the questions that can be asked for the future? And this is, of course, extremely transformative and extremely useful. It also is providing, and this is possibly something that is a bit less talked about, a very important opportunity for, for scientists to rethink what the scientific process really is and how do the data and the big data in this case actually fit in what used to be traditional scientific methodologies. This is wonderful because this is really allowing people both at the um, you know, scientific level of the laboratory but also at the level of policy and particularly right now there are a lot of transformative movements in European policy and the European Commission is doing a lot of work on this to really rethink how people publish in research, how research results are disseminated, how they're exchanged and how does that actually, what does it mean for how we collaborate in research both across different disciplines and very importantly across different countries and different kinds of networks. Obviously, we talked a lot already about the power of automation and the fact that computational tools can be put to the service of accelerating research, so I'm not going to really discuss this much. And um, the idea behind open data specifically is the fact that we can think about data as objects that travel very widely. So historically, data have actually not really quite traveled as much as people would like them to do now. Typically, uh, scientists would go into their labs or into their field, they would produce data, they would select out of those data which particular data set best supports some of the hypotheses that they want to put forward, then they would publish those hypotheses as a scientific paper, and the only visible data that would go in the wider community would be the data that are directly associated as evidence to the kind of claims that scientists want to defend. Now, the situation is actually changing quite dramatically with increasing calls, particularly for publicly funded research, to make data very widely available and to do so without really sifting through the data first. So, all data that are produced under particularly governmentally sponsored research now is under an obligation under e the new EU law that's coming in now to be disseminated widely and to be made open. So this has a number of implications, and what I want to explore particularly is the kind of promise that this has um, for the world of biology. So what does it mean to think about the power of big data in the context of biology and biomedicine specifically? Well, one of the very big challenges that we're facing in biology and biomedicine, which is not quite the same thing as happening in other sciences, is of course that life is a very slippery thing. It comes in countless uh, types of variation. It comes with an incredible amount of complexity. And so to be able to capture this, um, biologists um, working in the field and, and, and medics and physicians have actually had to adapt to this diversity. What this means is that there's an enormous amount of types of data that are used to try and unravel and document um, nature and particularly living things within it. And this comes in all sorts of different formats, all sorts of different media, and they range from, as you can see here, physical objects from which data can be extracted in all sorts of different ways of the type that you see uh, showcased, for instance, in natural history museums, to um, photographs and notes taken from interactions in the field with particular kind of animals, in this case, in primatology, to um, drawings and, again, um, notes taken in fieldwork, 
to um, all sorts of different kinds of photographs and microscopy tools, to um, digitally produced data such as in the case gene expression, to of course uh, sequencing and genomic data. So this already poses quite a big question in terms of how do we bring all these different resources together in a way that actually allows us to integrate them properly. Uh, the second big challenge is that partly because of this incredible variation and the complexity of all of these different objects of study, biology in history has been possibly the most fragmented of all sciences. So many different uh, subfields, many different communities here, and each of these communities tend to focus on a specific type of organism, on a specific kind of environment, and a particular type of ecosystem. And even within communities that are looking at one particular kind of organism or a particular species even, they have very different uh, sub-communities that target a particular aspect of that species. And here you see a typical um, subdivision of this, where people are looking at actually the level of the molecule, for instance, in molecular biology, or looking at um, cell biology very specifically, or looking at problems to do with tissues, or with organs, or with the whole organism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what this means is that these divided communities in biology have grown up having very different methods that they're using, different theoretical perspectives on the phenomena that they're um, trying to study, and these are all justified. So the fact that you have a lot of pluralism, as we say in philosophy, in this field is perfectly justified because people have developed over the course of many decades and sometimes centuries very sophisticated tools to be able to tap into very particular systems in biology. Now, these are wonderful and very rich, but it becomes very problematic when one attempts to do system levels, integrative analysis of particular sites and all the organisms that are within those sites, of interactions that go all the way from the composition of um, genes and, and molecular biology all the way to the whole organism and the environment, and of course when trying to compare different organisms. So the question that people are asking at this point is can big data and technologies which relate to big data fuel this kind of cross-system, cross-level, integrative understanding? Which we of course need very badly if we want to really understand uh, what is going on at the molecular level, how that impacts um, like how organisms behave in the world, and reciprocally, how the environment actually shapes some of the um, mechanisms in our bodies. Now, a lot of um, the promise of big data, and whether this promise is actually going to be realized, depends on the quality of the integration of the data therein, and the seamlessness of it. So, on one hand, you actually have to have access to data collections around the world. And this has to be accessed both to give data, if you're the kind of scientist who produces data in this space, and to retrieve data and find data that might be useful for your work. You also need to have data sets which are to some extent compatible, and databases which are interoperable. And what this word, which is very important in this field, means is that even if the databases are built in different ways and they have different assumptions behind them, you can still use them together to actually answer the same question. And of course, you need to have computational tools that allow you to search for the data that you may uh, find useful for your research and to retrieve them. And possibly most importantly, you need to have a sophisticated visualization tools that allow you to order the data that are available and start to spot patterns in them that may be useful for your research. So the big challenge here is how to link and analyze very disparate data sets that come from very different sources without, at the same time, losing that all too precious specialized knowledge that people have accumulated on the particular systems that you have. So the kind of research I'm doing is trying to understand how uh, biologists and uh, physicians and biomedicists actually are um, really trying to solve this challenge and specifically looking at how data are disseminated and integrated in contemporary research practice. And the idea here is that this can bring insight to all sorts of much broader questions about how research actually is practiced, what is the epistemology of research, and what kind of knowledge we get out of this kind of research, and also what is the relationship between this kind of research and society at large, how the research needs to be regulated, and what is the role of infrastructures and automation in this.
So the kind of work that I'm doing in my group is um, we're calling this uh, tracking data journeys. And really the point is to use instruments which are very qualitative, so coming from the philosophy of science, the history of science, and science and technology studies, so the sociological and anthropological study of science, to try and understand and follow how research data move from situations where they're actually originally created, so in a particular lab, in a field site, to situations when they're being disseminated, to situations when they're finally being used and then reused uh, potentially across many, many different sites that might find those data useful and, and um, contributing to the research. So the main focus of our research, really our starting point, is to look at databases. And this is because we think that databases and data infrastructures of the types of this kind of technologies really are wonderful windows into the kind of material, conceptual, institutional labor which is required to make data so widely available and in fact to make data open in some way. So the kind of things that we tend to analyze are things like the kind of labels which are used in these databases to order the data and retrieve them, the algorithms and the software which is used, and in fact also we're looking at how the infrastructure is managed and how in and, and, and how the, man, the communications around this kind of research are managed so that data can actually keep moving along in these kinds of journeys. I will give you examples in a second. And particularly, we're also looking at cases of data reuse when people are, in fact, um, enabled to do new discoveries through these kinds of tools. And we're really trying to investigate the conditions under which this can happen. And of course, there's all sorts of questions, which I will get to in a second, about the role of intellectual property and information security issues in here. There's also a lot to say about the role of the open science movement and what it means to have open data in this kind of um, environment. Now, one of the spaces which I've been doing most of my work in is the space of so-called model organism biology. This actually represents a vast majority of the experimental work done um, in biology at the moment. And this is biology which is done on these kinds of organisms. One of the most famous ones here, of course, is the mouse. So particular species which are taken by large communities of biologists as a focal point for their investigation. And of course, one of the main issues with focusing on these model organisms is exactly the fact that you can then bring together data that comes from all sorts of different subfields in biology, ranging from molecular biology to developmental biology, cell biology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, focusing on model organisms such as the mouse. Here you see the fruit fly, Drosophila meganogaster, and this is actually my favorite organism of the bunch, which is the most important model organism for plant biology, called Arabidopsis thaliana, or tail cress. Like, to accumulate knowledge on these organisms, you have to try and bring together various types of data, and, and this is a very important effort which has been ongoing since decades, and it really serves and has served until now as an important reference point for other initiatives and other ways to actually set up a digital infrastructure to disseminate data widely. And in fact, it has widely informed the development of disease databases and all sorts of different biomedical and agricultural data infrastructures. So an important initiative. Now, don't be too scared by the next slide. This is, a high, this is going to be a very highly simplified slide giving you a little bit of background on what I mean by data journey in this kind of space, focusing very specifically on data which comes from this plant, Arabidopsis. So what you have here is a very simplified, believe it or not, um, representation of the kind of movements and intersections that are involved in following data around as they travel. So we start from here. You have all sorts of different data in different formats that get submitted or get absorbed in complex ways by a particular data infrastructure. Here I'm looking at, in a sense, a relatively simple one here, which is called the Arabidopsis Information Resource, which is one of the main databases collecting particularly molecular um, data about this little plant that I talked about. Um, now, the point of inserting all this information in the database 
is that you can eventually go to the browse section as somebody who is doing research on plants or on other organisms and is interested in finding whether there's data in this database that can actually be useful to you in your research. And you want to come up with all sorts of different visualizations that allow you to check which data are there and eventually also start to explore their potential meaningful, uh, meaning and their potential significance for the kind of questions you want to ask. Now, behind this relatively simple infrastructure, there is a lot of collaboration and in fact, there is a highly nasty structure of very many different databases, repositories, and um, technologies which are interacting with each other to make it possible to actually disseminate data in this way. So for instance, there has to be a link with some of the main initiatives in biology and beyond, which are trying to provide um, sophisticated software for this kind of data dissemination. And here we're talking about already hundreds of researchers involved in trying to make sure that there is appropriate software to actually be able to visualize data in this way and to store them appropriately. You want to interact with people such as here at Intermine, based in Cambridge, um, that are specialized in, again, large groups in making sure that the data that you insert in this database are not just useful for people who study this little plant, but are useful for people to st who study lots of other organisms. And that means actually trying to um, standardize these data formats as much as possible. You also want to interact with people who are thinking very hard about what is the conceptual background to all of this and what kind of terminologies do we use to refer to the kind of things in the world that we want to study, such as metabolism, pathogens, you know, different components that are forming really the core of the kinds of questions that biologists will ask. And again, there's like hundreds of people really involved in trying to provide labels that can serve this purpose. And there is a tight link to things which are called stock centers in this case, which are repositories of physical organisms. So in this case, it will be a seed center, which actually collects the seeds of all the different mutants on which data are being accumulated here, which means that you can go to this database and not only look at the data that interests you in a digital sense, you can also order the stocks, the particular seeds of the plants that you're interested in so that if you want, you can actually replicate some of these experiments in your own lab, and you can continue that work with the same materials. So the material world has a very important um, role to play in here too. Now, what is the big challenge here? Obviously, we're having a very complex situation, which actually gets even more complex, with lots of interdependent databases, which collect different types of data and which have different approaches. And Trying to make this interoperable, so really communicate with each other, is extremely difficult. You need to have language that actually works across these platforms. You need to have so-called metadata, so have similar information about where did it actually come from, how they were produced. And you need even to have standards for what counts as reliable data, because many of the people involved here would have different ideas about what constitutes good data and which data are most useful to then try and uh, project inferences. So there are very real challenges in developing these databases and also extremely difficult challenges in updating them because there's such an amount of manual curation and human judgment going into actually making this possible that then updating the whole system, that's something that people already referred to um, yesterday, becomes really challenging, very important, but very challenging here. So on one end, Having common standards here is not enough. You actually really do need to have a several steps of a data journey, the intervention of human trained judgment to actually make decisions about how do these data sets best help us to answer certain kinds of questions. And in fact, when human curation is not present, we have lots of situations where many databases also with important data in them tend to disappear, or possibly even worse, they tend to just um, become stabilized and stagnate, and they're not anymore updated to actually keep up with the shifts in the meantime in our knowledge base, what we know about the world and how we want to use the data. So these are just some examples of some of the kind of work that goes on within databases to actually try and make sure that um, the conceptual structure of these um, interfaces is really um, appropriate for the job, and this is, I think, one of the most important ones, which I've done quite a lot of work on, called biontologies. And um, I'm not going to go into a long explanation of what these are, but basically this is an attempt to define very precisely, and in fact to standardize, the kind of language that is used to retrieve the data. So if I go into a database and I say, 
you know, what data are available on cell metabolism here, on this particular species, database should be able to actually give you an answer to that question. This is, of course, made very complex by the fact that within biology and within medicine, people don't really tend to agree on terms. They tend to have different um, uh, definitions for, for the same term, even. And sometimes these differences are actually quite important and significant for the research. So this is an attempt to actually produce something that allows you to overcome these different differences in language. And one of the interesting things here is, again, this really, I would argue, is in fact a form of theorizing. It actually requires a huge amount of competence. It requires lots of different experts coming together and having what I regard as almost philosophical discussions around what are the right terms to be used to refer to things in the world as a biologist. So a lot of work goes into creating these kinds of things. I'm actually, sorry, I'm gonna, not going to go into this because I want to go to the next case. Now, I want to consider specifically biomedicine and biomedical infrastructures, because there are issues there that come up in a much um, more important sense than in some of the biological databases. And these are issues to do, of course, with the privacy of the data which are inserted in there from human patients, and the security of this data, and even the quality of the data that are inserted here. So these are very big preoccupations for people who are trying to put together biomedical data infrastructures. And in fact, one of the big concerns for people who are trying um, to do this is that um, concerns around the security of the data and ethical concerns around the data may actually slow down the development of these infrastructures, partly because they slow down um, how you actually put the technology together, because you have to put lots of safeguards in place and lots of different types of regulations to make sure that data will not be misused. But also because eventually, because you have to sometimes anonymize the data, this will actually make it um, less feasible for scientists working with this data to really um, uh, dig into their significance because it's going to be much more difficult to associate the data with particular populations in particular parts of the world. Of course, there's also a lot of concern around the fact that security issues and ethical issues will in fact uh, reshape the very infrastructure that we have and in fact can, can reconfigure the relationship between partners because lots of different uh, types of partners here need to be involved in making sure that the data are secure as they travel and that their, um, the ethical considerations are respected. And in fact, that there's a lot of considerations here which are very hard to predict and to control, which again makes it something that a lot of um, biomedical researchers are worried about. At the same time, the argument I want to make is that thinking very deeply about security and confidentiality can actually provide a wonderful opportunity to enhance the long-term sustainability like the, you know, the extent to which we can use this data in the future, and in fact, to optimize the quality of these data collections. I'm going to give you very quickly an example of one of the cases we're looking at. Um, this is just the front page of the website of the Secure Anonymized Information Linkage Data Bank, which is a data bank based in Cardiff in Wales. They play a very, very important role in the medical system there because they, basically they are acting as a collector for all sorts of different data coming from hospitals, coming from GPs and doctors, coming from patients themselves, and also coming from biological research and biomedical research, which is relevant to the understanding of disease. And what they're doing is they're providing a secure interface so that this data is not just openly available to anybody, but only to people who have good reason to actually come and ask for those data. But not only this. They're actually having an information governance structure which allows them to, in fact, mediate between the people who are trying to use the data to do new research and the kind of data collections that they have. So what happens in a complex arrangement like this is that if you're a researcher that wants to do um, research on these kinds of data, coming from hospitals, for instance, in Wales, you would approach this data bank and you would say, you know, I have this kind of question I think I need certain kinds of data to answer them, but what do you think based on the data that you have in store? And here you would have a lot of experts that actually would be able to answer that question and efficiently sift through the database and actually provide researchers with information about which of these data sets they should be getting access to and why this is actually important for their research. So again, this is a situation where the data infrastructure becomes much more than a technology it becomes an ensemble of experts that are absolutely crucial in mediating the journey of data from their initial generation to situations where they can actually be reused efficiently. <laughs>
Now, one also of the things I wanted to mention very quickly is the fact that materials are very important in this, so this is not just a travel of virtual objects, but in fact the travel of material objects is very important. And also, I want to mention the fact, actually, sorry, I'm going to skip this too because I'm running out of time. So I want to also mention the fact that partly because of the complexity of this data structure, and in fact the enormous amount of investment and resources that goes into producing a technology and a set of people around it that can really serve the travel of data in research. You actually have a situation where a lot of the claims which are typically made about um, how inclusive this kind of research is and how it can help people from all over the world to actually tap into existing data sets and reuse them for their research become a little bit more shaky. So the idea that big data is automatically inclusive and open data allows access to all sorts of people around the world to this kind of development is problematic because you have a situation where, in fact, the digital divide, so-called, is very alive and very well. And I think this came up already yesterday substantially. And what we are seeing within research specifically is that when it comes to develop this kind of infrastructures, the involvement of labs which are doing research which maybe is not that well funded, relatively poor, is not fa very fashionable, is very low. And it means that researchers which are working in low-income countries or in low-income laboratories are usually involved in this only at the receiving end, so just as users, but not really as people who are involved in some of these developments. And this typically means that they use them much less. So databases, typically in this um, situation, end up displaying the outputs and the data of laboratories which are very rich, typically, already have very high visibility, and they're English-speaking. Now, this has all sorts of um, implications for the kind of research that is represented in this kind of databases, and also for the kind of inference that one can draw. So, for instance, when you're trying to go to these databases to make inference about what a certain um, a type of population, um, how, what, what is the relation between a certain kind of population, a certain sample of the population, and their reaction to a disease, you're going to find that actually the sample you're working on within the population is very restricted because it doesn't take account of all sorts of um, different populations which are not represented in these databases. Similarly, uh, there's lots of places in the world where um, there is access to materials that we don't have an access in, on um, to in uh, Western countries. And again, this is not very well represented because these materials cannot be really incorporated. Data on these materials cannot be incorporated in databases because there is no obvious um, way to do so. So there's a sense in which inequalities of um, resources, of visibility, of power, and of location, which are already in the scientific world now, risk to actually be amplified and reinforced in this picture, rather than being mitigated. So I think the main conclusion I want to go to is actually equals very much the conclusion that Massimiliano Bucchi already gave yesterday, which is that building technologies to make sure that data is collected in the proper way within science, travels to where it needs to go, and is reused in a way which is really reliable and is significant, takes time, it takes a lot of resources, and takes a lot of planning ahead. There is a situation where, when, if we're thinking about building safeguards for social and ethical concerns within data technologies, this takes time, this actually means that maybe the technology needs to adapt to this, but in fact, it can really help to make the result in science much better. So it helps to make it much more methodologically sound because you can try and make sure that all the elements you need to travel with the data, such as the information about the data, the samples and the materials that need to be available so that people can actually replicate the results uh, are actually there. It makes it more accountable and engaged with stakeholders which are involved in all sorts of different parts of um, these trajectories. It can make it much more robust to the fact that the requirements and the challenges, both in terms of the big challenges in society, but also in terms of the kind of technologies that are keeping evolving here, are um, robust, and actually you can really um, try and adapt to this. And in that sense, you can make uh, the science much more resilient to the different uses that you can have here. And you can actually be a little bit more risk-taking and explorative, and at the same time, not sacrifice the quality of the science and its reliability. And of course, potentially, and probably, this will make the science faster, but still, it will allow to prioritize uh, good practice in the long term. Thank you very much.